All right. I hope you're all having a great Monday. Welcome. This is Law and Crime Report. I'm your host, Bob Bianchi. We got a lot of great stories on the plate today. Always appreciate having you guys here. Uh, the first one is Ayula Ajayi, uh, who has been found guilty, pled guilty to a life without parole sentence for killing a Utah University student, uh, Mackenzie Lewick. It was really a brutal crime. They had met on a dating website in 2018. She went to meet with him. He has admitted that he planned to kill her before she even got there. He bound her up, strangled her, choked her, and then eventually burned her body. He pled guilty to murder as well as the desecration of human remains. The father had no sympathy for the defendant at all, as you can expect, and hoped to see him rot and die in jail and that he'd be alive to see it. The judge also had some choice comments to make. Let's take a listen. Having considered all the information then presented in this case, including the Rule 11 plea previously approved by the court, the sentences are imposed as follows. Uh, as follows. In case number 19190-6862, count one criminal homicide, aggravated murder, a first degree felony, life in prison without parole. Count two, abuse or desecration of a human body, a third degree felony, uh, the maximum sentence of an indeterminate term at the Utah State Prison of not more than five years. In case number 19190-8319, count two, forcible sexual abuse, a second degree felony, the maximum sentence of an indeterminate term at the Utah State Prison, of not less than one year and no more than 15 years. In all cases, the rest or restitution is ordered. The defendant has admitted to and is now convicted of arguably three of the most egregious of crimes in the criminal code. The crime of aggravated murder, the crime of abuse or desecration of a human body, and the crime of forcible sexual abuse. If certain penalties, including concurrent or consecutive sentences, are reserved for the worst cases, each of these charges on their own has the seriousness and magnitude or enormity that merits consecutive sentences. The facts surrounding the death of Ms. Lewis, beginning with the planning of her murder, the murder itself, and the manner in which it was committed, the desecration of her body afterwards shows the type of extreme cruelty and depravity that calls for nothing less than consecutive sentences. Likewise, the facts and circumstances surrounding the defendant's conduct in case 19190-8319 merits consecutive sentencing as well. The spectrum of criminal cases where these offenses and the facts surrounding these offenses lie is such that the most serious penalty should be imposed, including consecutive sentences. We also have in these two cases two different victims. As I stated, a sexual assault on a victim and a killing of a victim are arguably two of the most serious and egregious crimes one could commit against another human being. One victim is killed, the other is seriously and utterly affected for the rest of her life. And a sentence to anything less than consecutive on all charges, even if it will not make a bit of difference because the defendant will spend the rest of his life in prison on the aggravated murder charge alone, will not adequately show the victims, their families, friends, and the community, that these crimes and the defendant's conduct are the worst of the worst. So these consecutive sentences that are imposed today may be more symbolic of society's intolerance for these types of crime and conduct. All right, there's the judge imposing consecutive sentences. Just to give you some context, he also pled guilty with respect to another victim where he was charged with forcible rape. That was what the judge was referring to when she said two victims. I've got two great guests with me, Joseph Scott Morgan, uh, one of our, our besties here at the Low Crime Network out of Jacksonville State University, board certified 
medical legal death investigator, and the author of Blood Beneath My Feet. You can find him at Medical Legal Death uh, on Twitter. Uh, Joseph, welcome to the show, sir. Thanks for having me, Robert. Absolutely. And we have Kelly Hyman, an attorney from the Hyman Law Firm, media TV legal analyst who uh, basically handles class actions and mass torts. We're going to be tapping into that ex uh, experience on some other cases that we have for you later on the show. Welcome to the show, Kelly. Thank you. It's great to be here. It's great to see you. Yeah, great to see you guys too. Hey, listen, you know, one thing that I found really interesting about this case was a comment that the prosecutor um, had made where he indicated that this wasn't about revenge. It wasn't about a relationship. Quote, the only conclusion that the evidence can suggest is that the defendant wanted to kill. Know what it felt like to kill someone. Murder for murder's sake. Let me start with you, Kelly. Um, the judge gave consecutive sentences here. I don't think there's anything shocking or surprising, but she has to lay a record out uh, for possible appeal of the sentence. She could have gone concurrent. Explain to us a little bit what the judge was saying as to why it was that she went with the consecutive sentence, especially with respect to the cruel and heinous nature of the crime, as well as two victims. This is a horrible crime. My thoughts and prayers go out to the family to lose someone so young, so beautiful, so bright and had such a wonderful future. Uh, the judge was basically setting an example, but uh, as you said, she was laying foundation if there was some kind of appeal. Um, what happened was he had the he allegedly had the intent when he, uh, that he was going to kill her and, 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 and murder her. And then what he did to her body to burn her body is such a crime that's against our human nature. And so the judge, by having consecutive um, sentencing, there is basically no way that he's going to get out of, out of jail. Um, and she wanted to let that be known and also lay a record for that as, as well. And, I, you know, I said before, there, as you said, there was another victim as well in regards to rape. And these are, are two, um, you know, young, uh, beautiful, bright women. And for one of them to lose their life this way is just horrific. I mean, for a parent to lose a young child is, is, is horrible. Yeah, you know, Joseph, you actually talk about this. Uh, I mean, I've seen excerpts of things that you put out there. And having been a person who's been at these crime scenes and investigated them from a forensic point of view, um, this was not solved for a year and a half after her disappearance. Um, and basically, the evidence here was that he had just basically tied her up as soon as she got to the home and choked her and then burned the body, removed the body when the police started investigating to another location. Talk to me a little mm -hmm. bit about the impact that occurs just from a personal point of view with those of you folks who go out there and witness these kind of things. Is it just business as usual? I don't mean to say that in a, a negative way. I was an EMT for many years. I've went on many murder cases, murder scenes myself. Uh, or, or do you, you take a little bit with you each time? Yeah, you do. Uh, you know, I still teach at the police academy in addition to my duties as uh, teaching uh, as a professor at Jacksonville State. And you know, one of the things I tell young cadets as they're going through is that just imagine you have a, a burl, an old burlap sack, and for every case that you encounter like this, uh, you put a one-pound stone in it. Mm -hmm. And as we say in the South, you tote it around on your shoulders for your entire life, and you're not allowed to put that down. There's, you can't escape this. Uh, it's it's horrible stuff. And and when you begin to examine what he had done, because, you know, he didn't just restrain her, Bob. He just didn't choke her. He flipped her over on her stomach and then used a ligature uh, with a belt and choked her out from the rear like this. He purposed in this case uh, to kill her, I believe, and also to uh, cover up his crime. He went to great, great lengths to do this. You know, initially he buried the body in the, in the backyard, then he burned her. And then when he sensed that the investigators were on to him, he transported her to a very remote location in a canyon. And if you've never been to Utah, uh, there is a whole lot of uh, remote in Utah. It's one of the things that makes it so very beautiful. Uh, but, you know, there's one other victim that we haven't mentioned in all of this, and uh, it's quite striking. And I think it goes to a thread that runs through this guy's behavior in his life. They found child porn in his possession. And I think that um, that this goes to kind of a thread that runs through a lot of these uh, behavioral uh, driven things. Yeah, you know, they say that, you know, it wasn't about money, it wasn't about revenge, it wasn't a, some kind of interaction they'd never met before. This guy 
uh, he was he was uh, powered, I think, uh, as a result of this kind of lust killing uh, that was going on. That's what this kind of comes down to, and it's it's some of the most ver uh, uh, ferocious killings that you can work as an investigator. So yeah, to say that uh, to say that you know those of us that work in the field mm -hmm. are scarred by this is an understatement. But the families, the families have mm -hmm. to bear this burden individually, you know, because yeah. there will always be an empty chair. And that's a great segue for us, Joseph, because I've always been amazed as a homicide prosecutor about all the people that are impacted, it, it, all the police and the forensic people, the prosecutors, when they have to deal with this. The mother gave uh, a statement, a victim impact statement in court. As you can imagine, the family is devastated by all accounts. It's just a beautiful person, uh, very well regarded, a, a spitfire, I believe, as she was called as one of the adjectives, um, and a very caring person. And also, don't forget, defense attorneys also have to deal with some of the emotional blowback of this as well. They're doing their job, but they're human beings too. Let's take a listen. Or hold the children in my arms. Or celebrate her first month, as she would say. So many things a mother looks forward to to be a part of. I feel for her dear brother, having their only sister taken from them, not having the opportunity to feel to help their sister in their life and to share the joy that they had to come with her. I feel the loss for all the people in her life would have touched. She was such a loving, caring daughter, sister, niece, cousin, and friend. This sentence today will not bring back McKenzie, but it's my hope that it will keep this defendant out of the public eye. I think our client has spent the last year and a half um, remorseful for his actions. He can't do what he did. But our, our hope and his hope was to spare anyone any further hearings or any further trauma with this and for him to accept the sentence that will be imposed and that will be it. For him. He, he is very sorry. Well, there you go. Uh, the defense attorney saying he's very sorry. And um, Kelly, let me go to you on this. I mean, a, as a defense lawyer, and I am one now, um, when you deal with these tragic and horrible cases, you defend your client with the zealousness that you should. People have a, a difficult time understanding that, but we all know that police and prosecutors aren't perfect. Mistakes get made. We need that kind of advocacy. But nevertheless, as a defense lawyer, you sit there sometimes and you just can't help but feel uh, for those victims. And, and it's funny because the victims kind of sometimes believe that the defense attorneys are uncaring and don't have any emotions towards their plight. And my experience has been with many defense attorneys, there could be nothing further from the truth. What do you think? No, absolutely. And as, as a, you know, as you know, the state has to prove their case. They have to prove the elements of their case. And as a defense attorney, you're advocating for your, your client. You're making sure that the state proves their case. And I think you have a good point that you know, uh, attorneys are human beings. I mean, you know, we we laugh, we we cry, um, we you know advocate. Um, but you know, we're also you know human beings and and have feelings, and and we want to make sure that you know people are represented. But you know, dealing with such a horrific um, incident and crime, I mean, it's it's very difficult um, mm. to you know to to do that. Yeah, maybe not this case, but I've often said because we have an adversarial system. We don't speak to one another, and the victim's families many times can feel that we're uncaring or that the defendant is not remorseful when uh, many times they are, but we're not allowed to have that kind of dialogue or conversation uh, because of the manner in which the system is set up. Guys, great job. we got a lot more on the plate here coming up at the Law and Crime Network. Next, Michigan Governor Whitmer development, possible defense in the case for those individuals charged with the idea of kidnapping her. Stay tuned on the other side of the break, and we'll discuss it. Good afternoon. Earlier today, Attorney General Dana Nessel was joined by officials from the Department of Justice and the FBI to announce state and federal charges against 13 members of two militia groups who were preparing to kidnap and possibly kill me. When I put my hand on the Bible and took the oath of office 22 months ago, I knew this job would be hard. But I'll be honest, I never could have imagined anything like this. I want to start by saying thank you to our law enforcement. Thank you to the fearless 
FBI agents. And thank you to the brave Michigan State Police Troopers who participated in this operation, acting under the leadership of Colonel Joe Gasper. I also want to thank Attorney General Nessel and the U.S. Attorneys Burge and Schneider and their teams for pursuing criminal charges that hopefully will lead to convictions, bringing these sick and depraved men to justice. As a mom with two teenage daughters and three stepsons, my husband and I are eternally grateful to everyone who put themselves in harm's way to keep our family safe. All right, hopefully lead to convictions. And here's the question. Is it a fantasy or was it reality? And the reason I say that is because the attorney that represents Ty Garbin, who is a Wolverine watchman, said the following. Saying things like, I hate the governor, the governor is tyrannical, is not illegal, even if you're holding a gun and running around the woods when you do it. And that's from a Mark uh, Satna, I believe his name is, um, Satna. So, uh, Satwa, I apologize. So, uh, Kelly, here we go. Now, this is not unprecedented. In 2010, um, it, there was a militia case where they were going to uh, try, it was alleged to murder a number of police officers, and seven defendants were found not guilty of conspiracy and sedition because they didn't identify specific targets. So this seems to be kind of following that same line of defense. In order to prove a conspiracy, you have to prove that two individuals were engaged in, in an, to do something that was illegal and that they took an overt act, a substantial step towards a common scheme or plan to do something illegal. Is this where we're going, that they were just kind of mouthing off, it's a fantasy defense, they really had no intention on doing it? Now, we don't know what all the evidence is, but that seems what that lawyer's statement is trying to indicate. Right, no, absolutely. You bring up a really good point, and I think that's exactly where they're going, that they didn't have the intent to do it, that you have a First Amendment right to say what you want, to say how you feel, However, that they didn't do anything, do any kind of overt act, and there wasn't any type of conspiracy. Ultimately, we're going to have to see what turns up and what evidence there is and, and how this ultimately plays out in court. Yeah, Joseph, what do you think about the, the whole thing? I mean, listen, as prosecutors in a case like this, you want more than mere words, because to Kelly's point, uh, you can say that, and to the lawyer's point, you can say all of those things, but if you do an overt act or take some substantial step towards it, what investigative things do you think are going on behind the scenes right now where prosecutors and police are trying to say, no, this wasn't a fantasy, this was the real thing? Yeah, I, you know, I, I would imagine at this point in time and, you know, from Jump Street when this whole thing went down, uh, they secured the location where these individuals were, were meeting up. And any kind of documentation that they may have had, maybe they were running through uh, running through possible scenarios, and they had paperwork that was that was attached to this to in order to facilitate this planning. Also, keep in mind these individuals uh, were found with weapons. Are those weapons in uh, their legal possession? Are these legally acquired weapons? Are they allowed? Are there any felons in the group? Do they le are they legally uh, 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 you know uh, uh, allowed to possess these weapons? And also. Uh, one of the, the really scary things for me was that they were uh, planning on using explosives and they had targeted a specific location is, you know, in military operations, they refer to as a choke point. That individual, that space where they can get in there and prevent anybody from uh, from uh, chasing after them and this sort of thing. And, and you know, it, it is very troubling, but you're going to have to, as an investigator, you're going to have to connect all these dots, uh, these dots. But here's the thing. Uh, an act, an actual act had not been committed yet. So, but we're not talking about a couple of guys sitting around a bonfire at night, you know, cracking beers and talking about how much they despise the governor or the government or whatever the case might be. You've got yeah. a whole group of these people that are involved in this. So my suspicion is, is that somebody is probably going to be singing like a bird. Yeah, a yeah, the very good point there. Uh, they definitely will try to flip somebody uh, but this goes a little bit more than that militia case I talked about in 2010, because it was a specific person where the other case wasn't. And the planning itself, Kelly, could that not go towards uh, the sophistication, the getting of armaments, um, the, the practice and training? Uh, you know, we, we don't know all the facts yet, but certainly those would all, in my mind, be considered substantial steps in, 
in um, actually going forward with that conspiracy, in my mind, no doubt. What are your thoughts? No, absolutely. I agree with you. You know, overt act. What exactly did they, they do? What was the plan? What was the scheme? What did they have in mind? Talk about if there's any kind of drawings that they did having guns. Well, you know, what did they discuss at their meetings? Um, and, you know, that's going to be really key to this case to kind of find out what their mindset was and what they had the plan and when they were going to do it and, and what each person's role was going to be. It'll be interesting to see how this ultimately plays out. Yeah, you know, uh, Scott, uh, Joseph, rather, um, Scott Morgan, the uh, next case we're going to be dealing about, Blood Underneath the Feet, is a book that you wrote. And usually when you showed up on those scenes, there wasn't questions really that much about whether a person was dead or not. But let's right. switch gears a little bit here to Jennifer Dulos. And, you know, photos Dulos is being accused, uh, as well as Michelle Traconis with regard to, part and a lawyer, and participating in her murder. Her body has never been found. Well, they're in probate court, <clears throat> which is a civil matter. And right now the judge has a question. Is Jennifer uh, uh, Dulos dead? She, she's not quite convinced yet. And the reason for that is that Connecticut law requires that a person must be missing for seven years before they're declared legally deceased. Seven years has not gone uh, up yet. Uh, so she wants to have the judge a hearing on this. Kathy, I want you to give me your impressions about this. And one interesting twist is the defense lawyer for Michelle Traconis is saying that he wants an evidentiary hearing before the probate judge rules as well to make a determination as to whether she's dead. So that's an interesting twist because obviously the prosecutors have to prove that the person is dead and you're having a judge saying they actually want a hearing. Is, is, is there a juror that may say the same? There's a question about her death? Yeah, you know, that's a really interesting point. As you pointed out that they have a statute, you know, it's seven, seven years to prove um, that someone is dead. So um, right now that time period, you know, hasn't come up. And so it'll be interesting to see what the judge, you know, ultimately uh, makes a determination and finds out if she is actually, you know, dead or not. Um, maybe there'll be some more kind of evidence that, that come up, um, you know, but she hasn't been found and it, it doesn't look like that she's going to be. I mean, my thoughts and prayers are with, you know, the family to, to lose a loved one. And I hope that they do, you know, find her alive and well. But as time goes on, more likely, um, you know, that, that she is is dead. Kelly, one last question on this point. Good move by the defense attorney if you're looking at this from a strategic tactical decision because the defense attorney is trying to find a way to kind of weasel in on this estate hearing in order to try to get data, to get information, have an opportunity to cross-examine witnesses pot potentially. Uh, all lawyers, defense lawyers, want to have a hearing of potential witnesses before uh, the actual trial to take a shot at them, take a crack at them, and cross-examine them later. Would you, do you believe that that's what the defense lawyer is doing here? Yeah, I think that's a good point because you kind of want to hear their story because sometimes witnesses will not want to meet with you or not want to talk with you and say, no, I'm not, I don't want to uh, meet with you. And so this gives them an opportunity to kind of hear their story and kind of know what's going on. So I think it's very smart from a strategic standpoint to kind of hear what they're going to say and, um, you know, how they are going to connect the dots. Smart. Yeah, Joseph, what are your thoughts about this whole thing? It's a little twisty. I've never seen anything like it, but the defense lawyers clearly are trying to leverage a civil matter into improving, yeah. hopefully, their criminal case. Yeah, for me personally, it's it's as a trial watcher, it's fascinating. You know, you, you go back to this to the old the old adage, the legal term that's used, corpus delecti. Uh, you know, in, in our in our sense, in the forensic sense, what do we have here from a scientific, from an evidentiary standpoint to say that this individual is no longer among us? You know, I know in certain circumstances you would look for, you know, I've I've seen or heard of certain cases where they would talk about uh, you know, they've got a copious amount of blood at the scene. Uh, the amount of blood at the scene is not compatible with living, and they've tied mm -hmm. the blood back to the individual that's deceased. One of the most interesting cases in Georgia, uh, going back years and years ago, as a matter of fact, Andy Griffith did a movie about it. It was called uh, Murder in Coweta County, a fascinating case to read about. And they literally you know, worked, and this is from a criminal perspective, they worked this case based on a single bone chip that they found after the body had been rendered down in a huge bonfire and it was floating in a little eddy in a creek. Sometimes these things can have an interesting twist or a conclusion, but I think it's a, a fantastic tactic on the part of defense to kind of get them to you know, open the books a little bit, to see what's going on, to kind of probe 
probe a bit uh, around the space here and, and see what information might come to light. All right, Kelly Joseph, thank you for the awesome commentary. As always, we have more on Scott Peterson. Can you imagine this? This case is still going on. There are more legal developments. The prosecution is on its heels. We're going to talk about that on the other side of the break. Stay with us. <laughs> You didn't watch the whole thing, though. No. You remember what part you saw? I mean, I don't know what yeah. to... Some cooking deal. I don't know. Okay. Cookies of some sort. They're talking about what to do with meringue. Um, and I I can't remember. Your house, you had the, the converted garage area. Is that your TV room like? Or yeah. Is that where you were then? Okay, did you eat any breakfast? Yeah, I don't know. When did you realize you were going to go fishing? Oh, that was a morning decision. It's either go, oh, morning go play golf at the club or, or go fishing. Um, okay. Seemed too cold to go play golf at the club. So, um, yeah, just decided to, you know, 9 30 or whatever than that. Mm -hmm. Just told what she was going to do for the day. And okay, so Bob, she told you what she was going to do for the day. Yeah. And what was that? Um, she's going to finish cleaning up. Like I said, she's walking the kitchen floor. Um, take the dog for a walk, and then she's going to the store to buy for Christmas morning breakfast tomorrow. And that was going to be a involved prep. So that was her afternoon, just prepping the breakfast, and she's going to make gingerbread cookies for tonight. All right, so this Scott Peterson developments have sparked a lot of debate on the Law and Crimes Facebook page. If you haven't liked it, you should, and weigh in on what your thoughts are about what's happening with all of our cases. But this one certainly has gotten a lot of play. Uh, Kelly, I want to talk to you a little bit about what's going on legally here. So I believe it was in August this summer that the courts reversed the death penalty conviction because of a juror-related issue with respect to how the judge conducted themselves, left the death penalty on the table if it, they can retry it, prosecutors, but they vacated the death sentence, at least as of now. And then to add insult to injury, there's another juror issue with respect to a juror who is alleged to have been untruthful with respect to revealing information that would have been critically important especially in relation to the closeness of the facts of this case. Now, that juror in her defense says, I didn't make the connection between those things. And the Supreme Court of the state said, no, 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 the judge needs to have a hearing on this to make a determination as to whether even the guilt phase is going to remain intact. And what I found interesting about the way the court ruled and in, in remanding it back to the trial court was that they gave the state till November 13th, 2020, to show why the conviction should stay in place. In other words, they're putting the prosecutors on the defensive with respect to that particular issue. This is something no prosecutor ever wants to have to revisit and God forbid, have to retry a case from 2002, staleness, witnesses lost, defense lawyers have all sorts of transcripts, a relatively circumstantial case. Uh, prosecutors have to fight this tooth and nail. What are your thoughts? 
No, absolutely. I mean, that's from a long time ago. You're looking many, many years ago, and you bring up a really interesting point. You know, to retry this case, the witnesses, you know, their their memory now is not as good as back as it used to be, and no one wants, you know, that. That's why it's always important when you try the case is you're always really mindful about, you know, the appeal and make sure that you cross every T and, and, and every, you know, I and stuff like that. And, you know, um, so that's really important. Now, um, about the, the juror's alleged misconduct, you know, to her defense, you said, she said, you know, she didn't um, think that there was an issue, that it was a totally different situation from her situation with, with you know, her ex-boyfriend. Um, uh, to the situation here and ha her having a restraining order, but ultimately the court said, no, we're going to send this, we're going to send this back. And so we're going to have to see, you know, how this, how this plays out ultimately in, in front of the court. Right. Uh, Joseph, I want to go to you on a, on a little bit of a sidebar of a point that not a lot of people are talking about, but kind of picks up on the theme I mentioned before. When you have to try a case a second time as a prosecutor, it rarely, in my opinion, gets better. What's it like for you as a witness you, the person that's on the stand that went through this all that time ago and then has to go back. And, you know, witnesses will always testify differently. It doesn't necessarily mean they're lying. Now there's a copious amount of transcripts for which the defense lawyers can cross-examine in addition to the information they previously had. Tell us what that experience is like for somebody like you. Yeah, to be a fact or expert witness in a circumstance like this is a hellish nightmare. I'll tell you why. Um, listen, for a witness that Say, for instance, uh, you know, just John Q. Uh, civilians walking down the street and they're handling, you know, they see her walk by with a dog. That's something that's kind of going to stick in their memory because they become part of this whole thing. Bob, let me tell you something. Since 2002 uh, to this point, let's just say I was still practicing, do you realize how many homicides I would have worked between now and then? Mm -hmm. You know, since that date, if I was still in practice. And yeah, I mean, to the rest of the world, the Lacey Peterson case. Uh, is something that's still fresh in their mind. You know, people that view this stuff, but people that are actually in the field and working cases, it's not like, you know, history freezes at that moment and you think about nothing else. You've still got unsolved cases that are floating about. Uh, you've got a myriad of evidence that's out there. That's another peripheral issue that you have to consider. You know, what's become of all the evidence in the in the interim with this case? Um, and And your own memory, your notes, all of this stuff gets very jumbled and convoluted. And, and that's one of the reasons that you lawyer types make us write so much, you know, document everything that we do. But still, at the end of the day, you're human. And it, it's very, very difficult to kind of recall these things. And so in that sense, advantage to the defense, uh, because it is very difficult. It's hard to recall, you know, what you may have said or done at that particular, at that particular time. And then if they admit that previous transcript and they say, well, back on this date, you stated this, you know, you wind up looking like a fool on a, st on a stand if you're before a jury. It goes to your own credibility as a witness. And so, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a nightmare scenario for anybody that's an uh, that's expert or a fact witness in, in a case like this. Yeah, having handled a death penalty case with a victim's family at one point in the middle of the trial said, please end this, give them a life sentence, let them plead guilty. We don't want to go through this anymore. Yeah. This family has gone through even more than that. They've had two stunning blows to the prosecution. So I wouldn't doubt, guys, in my mind, that defense lawyers may tactically, if, if, the, if the defendant wants to do it, Scott Peterson wants to do it, go and say, let's cut the deal. Cut me out of the death penalty. I'll do my life sentence. At least they want to give it a shot because that's what defense lawyers want to do, spare the life. We'll see what happens. We got to go on to another story. And it's really a sad story. Vanessa Bryant, Kobe Bryant's wife, uh, was forced, in my mind, to file a lawsuit against the sheriff's department because a number of officers had taken graphic photos of the victims and shared them. The suit is for uh, negligence, invasion of privacy, intentional infliction of emotional distress. The sheriff in that case admitted that eight of the deputies took or shared graphic photos, that he ordered the images deleted. Um, and the, the just crazy to me, delete that evidence. It still is evidence, even though it was inappropriately taken. It should have been seized and deleted from their devices. And just to round this all out, the sheriff's offices has the department policy. You can't take pictures at crime scenes, but you can for gr grotesque and gruesome accidents like the death of Kobe Bryant, uh, his daughter, 13-year-old daughter, seven others, I believe, in that plane crash. Um, well, uh, Kelly, you are the mass torts litigator, our civil expert. 
um, in, in this case. Uh, it's just really an unseemly thing that she had to be forced to file this lawsuit. And secondly, speak to us a little bit about what happened jurisdictionally. She filed it in the state of California, I believe it was, but the defense was successful. That is the sheriff's department in having it moved to federal court, uh, which Ms. Mrs. Bryant did not want to happen, but nevertheless, they're not pleased about that. Tell me what your thoughts about all that. Sure. Well, my thoughts and prayers go out to everyone that was involved in the accident and lose a family member. I mean, it's so difficult to lose a family member and then to have private you know, photos, um, you know, put out there for all the world to see. So that's why she's basically bringing a claim for, you know, invasion of, of, of privacy and also emotional distress. The fact that she had to see these photos, horrific photos of her husband and her beautiful um, daughter. And so that's why she's, she's bringing these, these claims and also to stop this from happening in the future. I mean, no one, you know, the loses a loved one should have their photos out there um, for the world to see. The right. Um, in regards to the, yeah. Yeah, now, Kelly, I was going to say, just to pick up on that point for a second, yeah. that's what Ms. Bryant said, is that she wants to make sure this doesn't happen to anybody in the future. Talk to me a little bit about what, how do you evaluate this case as a plaintiff's lawyer if you were representing uh, Ms. Bryant? Well, how would you evaluate it in terms of success, likelihood of success? And the big age-old question, what are the damages in your mind that could come about as a result of that? It's a big mystery we never know until it either settles right. or the jury makes a decision. Right. Well, I don't like to give any uh, predictions because you never know what's going to ultimately happen, you know, in, in the in the court. Um, but from, you know, her standpoint is is that one of it is, is to get, you know, some kind of reform. So they stop doing this. But also, you know, how can you compensate someone? I mean, you you can't. The, the, the stuff is already out there. So the way to compensate them is is monetarily. Um, and so but ultimately, that's what the jury would make a determination um, after reviewing all the evidence, mm -hmm. if, if they believe it, then make the determination on how much the 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 um, plaintiff should get. And going back right. to your point about um, federal court, so the, there's their state and there's also federal court. And so the case was filed in state court. However, she brought a federal claim under the Constitution, under the 14th Amendment. So the defendant um, wanted the case to go from state court to federal court, saying that she brought a federal claim. And so um, that's right. why now the case has been moved from state court to federal court. Yeah, and two interesting things. The defendants, the sheriff's office, actually crossed complaint, filed a cross complaint against two federal air traffic controllers. Um, and the uh, Ms. Bryant's legal team was basically saying that was all the way of trying to add this all together in order to get it out of the jurisdiction where she wants it and that they're form shopping Joseph. Talk to me about the ethical propriety from an ethical uh, point of view. What is happening here? Is this a breakdown in policies, procedures? Like you had seven or eight of these officers doing this. How bad a violation is this? And should these officers be called the task for it? Yeah, they should be. They should be on the carpet immediately. Uh, it, you know, and, and think back a few years ago, Bob, the uh, name that comes to mind is Dale Earnhardt. Uh, you know, the, the widow in that particular case took, uh, she took a preemptive stance uh, relative to viewing his autopsy photographs and that sort of thing. And, and Florida really locked that down. It actually did a little bit of harm for us in forensics that are trying to utilize autopsy photographs for the purposes of instruction. But in this particular case where you have, I view it personally, anybody else title their opinion, I view it as a sacred, you know, kind of a sacred duty when I'm out on the scene and you're taking photographs of something um, and you're using your personal phone, first off, the individuals that are taking the photos, I'd have to say, well, what in the hell is your purpose for taking this photo, this photograph? Is this an evidentiary thing for you? Yeah. Or are you just doing this as, as kind of a, a ghoulish sideline? Do you realize how many websites there are out there uh, that buy things like yeah. this? I mean, they're everywhere. Yeah. It's absolutely yeah. a horror show. Yeah, and it's going to be like really difficult to get those things off. Guys, thank you so much for this excellent commentary. Uh, we're going to be coming back with a, a, a melee that occurred right at a Trump rally and an anti-protesting rally where a man pulled a gun on some folks. Stick with us. We'll be back with that story on the other end of the break. Welcome back. I'm your host. This is Law and Crime Report. Now, what is going on? What is happening out there? Okay. A man who is a Trump supporter winds up in an altercation, pulls a gun. There's videotape of this. It's 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 amazing. Take a look. Hey, 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 hey,
Hey, hey, hey, gun, gun, gun. He's pulling. What's your name? What's your name? What's your name? What's your name? I'm calling the police. I'm calling the police. What's your last name? What's your name? What's your name? What's your name? What's your name? Daniel Burris. Daniel Burris, okay. What's your name and what's your name and what's your name? Because I got it on video that you pulled a gun on girls. I have it on video. It's fucking water, you snowflake. It's water. It's water, you snowflake. It's fucking water. <laughs> I, guys, I, I just can't, like, just believe what's happening out there. Now, let's let's wrap this up. The police say the man was cooperative. They are looking for the man who supposedly dumped a 50, uh, do I have this right? 50-gallon drum of, a five-gallon, rather, drum of some liquid on this man. The man claims it had urine and spit in it, and that's what precipitated the incident that you saw right there, and he pulled the gun out and confronted those folks. Uh, Kelly, let's just talk about the legalities of this. I mean, pulling a firearm out and pointing it at her in the direction uh, of another individual unjustifiably, and that usually comes down to what is reasonable, uh, can be considered a crime. But, you know, by the same token here, I mean, what are these folks doing? They call him a snowflake if it is true that they dumped a five-gallon. It could, could have been acid for all he knew. It could have been infected. It could have gotten in his eyes. You could get COVID. Uh, what are your thoughts legally about this whole mishmash that we got going on here? Uh, crazy. <laughs> yes. You know, when we only saw parts of it, I mean, I wish we could see the whole thing of what actually happened beforehand the, of, of him being um, the water thrown on him. But to, to, no matter what, to, you know, they shouldn't have done that. They shouldn't have put water on him. But to pull out a gun, I mean, it, you know, I, the fact that you hear in their voice that the girls are, you know, these are young girls that are terrified that someone's pulling out a gun. How did the guy, you know, started shooting them? I mean, well, did that well, was that really justified? Yeah. Well, well, okay, I'll, I'll play devil's advocate with that, Joseph, just a little bit. And I, I get your point. And that is really the question that you're asking. But, you know, when we're trained in the, in, in the academy to firearms, now I know that this is a civilian, but the pulling of a weapon out is what they call constructive use of force. Officers who may not have the ability to be able to use lethal force are allowed to pull their weapons out. And I, I know he's not a police officer, but in order to back people off because they feel like they're in danger, there's people yelling and screaming, things are going on. I mean, it's clearly going to be what he's going to say. I pulled it out. I did not use lethal force. I reholstered the weapon as soon as I knew I was not in any danger. Do you think that that's where he goes with this? Yeah, it's, it's the only direction he can go with it, you know, uh, that thought. And uh, I'm, you know, I'm with Kelly on this. I, I, I would have liked to have seen more of the video. I wish that they had been, they had acquired that bit of tape. I'd like to see well, first off, why in the hell does somebody show up with a five-gallon bucket of anything to a protest? All right, I'm from New Orleans. I've, I've, I've been to countless Mardi Gras. I've never shown up to a Mardi Gras parade with a five-gallon bucket of anything. And so, you know, and, and those can be sketchy moments in time. I got to tell you, I'm, I'm scratching my head over this. But, yeah, people need to be fully aware of their surroundings. And I can tell you, this guy's going to talk about he felt like he was in threat for his life. Yeah, well, Kelly, listen, they debriefed him. They said he was cooperative. Some of the laws I do know out of Washington State, and I, they're very complex, like they are across the entire country. You need an abacus to figure out what you can and can't do. But they have a concealed uh, carry. Uh, you have to have a permit to have a concealed carry, but they have an open carry state. So we don't know about that particular issue. Um, and, and again, we're going to get Kelly down to this idea of whether it's reasonable. If the cops aren't going to pursue it and they're looking for the guy who dumped the five-gallon liquid, it seems like the cops have made a decision that that's the person they're going to target in this case. Otherwise, he would have been arrested. Is that going to change? You know, I don't know. Maybe there's going to be some more evidence. You know, maybe once, because like I, uh, Joseph said, you know, it'd be nice to see the whole video of what happened beforehand and maybe more evidence will come to light and maybe there will be something in regards to the person that put the water and then also the person that pulled out the, um, the gun but we're gonna have to wait and see what happens on that um but you know to pull out a gun in front of the young people um is is, is concerning and, and and upsetting um you know to have that because you don't if you're on the other end you don't know what the person is is gonna do um yes, and what their thought is Certainly could escalate the situation. Guys, real quick, in 10 seconds or less, is, is this going to end after this election, or do you anticipate these kind of crazy incidents on both sides of the equation? It's just going to escalate. Joseph? I'm voting for escalation. Uh, you know, um, what can I say? I'm jaded. I see this thing continuing to spin like this. So, yeah, it, 
people have got to get a handle on themselves, personal responsibility. Kelly, 10 seconds. I think it's going to depend on what happens in 2020 and who's elected. Um, if I we have a president that's going to divide us or a president that's going to unite absolutely us. Absolutely agree. Guys, I got to go wrap it up. We'll see you later in the week. Stay tuned for our regularly scheduled programming. Thank you.